us. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study today, and as we open the book of Ezekiel, we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his watch care, and for his blessing as we consider these examples and how they relate within the movement, within the church, and how this relates to the message that is to be given to the world. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you provided and are providing on this day. Father, as we open your word, as we consider the words of your prophet, help us now be with us so that we may clearly be able to learn from you and have the wisdom to understand that which we need to know for this time in earth's history. We pray for your spirit, for your spirit's attendance with us in this meeting. We pray also for your angels, for their watch care and for their guidance. I thank you for those, Father, that have come to this meeting. I pray for each one that this will be a profitable meeting, that we may understand more that you would have us to know so that we may be prepared to give the message that you would have us to give at the end of verse history. To this end, we praise you. For this, we thank you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as we were addressing yesterday, as we were looking at specific portions of the book of Judges, we discussed returning to the book of Ezekiel as well to address items, to look at these as to how the abominations that we see presented in Ezekiel 8 would interrelate with what we were seeing yesterday in Judges chapter 10. Now, in the presentations and the meetings that we had on the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 8 is a chapter that is a dividing line. This is one that divides Ezekiel's first vision from his second. And as the translators of the King James had shown, verse 1, Ezekiel is brought in a vision of God to Jerusalem. We recognize that Ezekiel is currently in Babylon at the time of this vision. And he has showed the image of jealousy set up in the temple. He's also showed the worship of the ancients in their chambers of imagery. He has shown the women weeping for Tammuz and the worshipers of the sun. Finally, he has also shown God's wrath for their idolatry. So we have being shown a group of four steps. Now, one of the reasons we're looking at this, or the main reason, is we're looking at this 18 years in Judges chapter 10, all verse 8. And in applying that 18 years, I made the suggestion that those 18 years are, are going to be counted from 2012 uh, to 2030. And that if, if, it, if those 18 years represent that, um, what would we mark in 2012? And we were looking at Parminder and the secret chambers. So that was, that was where we started with that. But as we started to look at um, Parminder's movement, I mean, he's, he's predicting a Sunday law, but his is, is a counterfeit. 
correct? His movement is definitely a counterfeit. Yeah, and his prediction of a Sunday law is an incorrect application for 2020. Right. right. Now, um, so the question is, does this progression, which we know applies to Adventism, um, basically four generations, um, can we apply this also to this movement? So that means in Judges where we've looked at these progressive um, uh, tests, that is these enemies that were left there to prove or test us, which are messages, and those messages that then responded to it. And then, of course, we had this internal issue with Abimelech, which is a rejection of the mess message of Gideon. And now Judges chapter 10 is going to bring us uh, more disobedience, further, further disobedience and oppression. But the question is, does this go back and then sort of reiterate something that had happened in the movement that shows that this has been um, a progression similar to that that we see in Ezekiel 8? That, that's sort of what we're examining. Is that a good summary of that? Um, I, I think it's well summarized. I have a question, though, to, okay. to throw this out at large. Um, we're looking at this 18-year period as it relates to the movement, going from 2012 to 2030. Now, is it possible that there is a second 18-year period, let's say one that goes from 2001 to 2019? Yeah, I thought about that too. Um, and, and I've actually looked at that other times. So, you know, if you go from 9-11. So, so what we had done with this 18-year uh, period is I'd actually counted it from uh, the, the 13th Bakhtun on December 21st, 2012. And I used um, 18 years times 360, right? So that's 6,480 days. Right. And when you, when you count that from that 2012 date, it brings you to January 1st, 2031. So we have this symbol uh, on our calendar that relates to the first day of the first month. And, and that's taking that line that we've had, uh, which is structured of the 777 structure, going from that Mayan date um, to, um, to this uh, Gregorian date. And, and that would parallel the April 5th, 2030 date that is also the first day of the first month. So that was kind of the significance there. Now, if we go from September 11th, um, and we're going to count 6,480 days. That's going, and that's going to bring us to June 9th, 2019. Now, June 9th is a symbol of. Now, it's in June 9th, 2018, that we had um, that time setting was introduced. Uh, well, it's going to be on June 10th, but Jeff is going to close the Sabbath with that 9-11 prayer. So it's going to be commencing uh, June 10th. Um, so this is one year later. I mean, right. So it would have been nice if it was like June 9th, 2018. But it's June 9th, 2019. And um, on the rabbinic calendar, it's the sixth day of the third month. It's the fifth day of the third month on the biblical calendar. But um, it's a one-day difference. But it is a symbol, it's a date that we use as a symbol for uh, time setting, right? So whatever that means, particularly, um, it, it could have something to do with 2019. Now in 2019, um, the, the significant date there is going to be in August. Correct? Right. Okay. So um, 
And if we did, uh, now the other thing that we could do is we could use biblical years. No, actually, I think what I did there is I used biblical years, come to think of it. I, I didn't use the prophetic years on the other one. Uh, I used the, yeah, because I'm trying to remember this here. Uh, so what did I do? Ah, right. So I used biblical years. So, so if I was going to use biblical years for this, that is, if I'm going to go to September 11th, 2001 that's going to be the 21st day of the sixth month and so i'd have to go to the 21st day of the sixth month in um uh, uh 2019 so it wouldn't it wouldn't end so so if i counted prophetic time it'd give me june 9th but if i do it this other way so that would be uh um it would be September 22nd, 2019. Now that's going to be you know, Sunday. So, so that's going to be the biblical date of 18 years. And of course, if I just did 18 solar years, it'd give me September 11th, 2019. So there's three different dates that I can get by using three different ways of counting a year, a prophetic year, a biblical year, or a Gregorian year. And so when I when I did the 2012 one, uh, I'm trying to remember which which one did I do? Uh, 20 yeah. So that's, that's what I did. I did December 21st, 2012, which is the um, the seventh day of the tenth month. And then I just used the seventh day of the tenth month in which ends up being 2031. Uh, so, no, what did I do? I'm trying to remember what I did. No, so that is where I count the. Uh, uh, it is where I count. Um, where is this here? Just hang on. I'm on the wrong. The wrong page. There we go. Um, sorry about that. So if I count from that December 21st, 2012, and again, 18 years, Yeah, so that's what I did. I used the biblical date um, to do that. Okay, so anyway, sorry, I just had to check that. But the point is here, so you asked the question about whether we can go from September uh, September 11th. Is that what you were saying? I, I'm saying from the, from the year 2001 to 2019, yes. Yeah, so I'm being very specific. Um, in providing these different dates. Um, but definitely, we, we could look at it that way. But the reason why we chose 2012 is it had to do with, my understanding is, is Parminder, unless you wanted to go back and say that the image of jealousy is put up in this movement in September 11th, 2001. I'm not saying that it's put up in the movement that way. I'm my consideration is as a second age in your period, whether this is another warning by our heavenly father to the church at large. Yeah. Okay. So I would agree with you there. And the image of jealousy there is going to be spiritual formation. Correct. So I, I think we already looked at that before, though we weren't trying to, at least as far as Ezekiel. Right. We weren't, we weren't attaching an 18-year period to it. We had not. Right. So the all I'm all I'm trying to look at here is since we have an 18-year period that we're looking at regarding the movement, did an, another 18-year period already transpire that has to do with the church itself? 
Yeah, and, and yeah, so we definitely could we we can we can <coughs> we can apply Ezekiel to the church. I don't know what would happen in the church in 2019 though that would mark I mean we could get to 2020 with the Sunday law but as far as the church supporting the state with the pandemic but I don't see 18 years ending in 2019 for the church we could apply Ezekiel to the church progressively in the context in that context but not I don't know if we could put the 18 years there okay that's okay so you've answered you answered the, the question that I I made okay all right so the the direction that we're taking here in in doing a quick overview in this with with Ezekiel we have a time frame that's been addressed because Ezekiel notes this as being the sixth year in the sixth month in the fifth day of the month. So this is the sixth year of his captivity, correct? Or is this, is this the sixth year since, was it um, Jehoiachin was taken captive? So those are the same thing, because Ezekiel's taken captive at the same time of Je as Jehoiachin. Okay. Right. So, yeah, it's the sixth year of now. The thing is, he's counting the sixth year, even though it's an ordinal count. Um, he's actually counting it as as uh, Jehoiachin would have counted his years of reign. So if Jehoiachin was reigning, it would have been Jehoiachin's sixth year. Um, so he's not counting it ordinarily like the first year of his captivity it wouldn't be the year he was taken captive, which is usually how you would say it. He's counting this um, as Jehoiachin's reign, which which I show other places. Okay. It's the only way that it works out. Um, but yeah, so it's the sixth year, the sixth month, the fifth day of the month. And we noted that in this uh, vision, he's going to um, actively do some things. That is, he's going to dig a hole in his house and kind of escape. Uh, typifying what's what uh, happens to um, 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 can't remember um, Jehoiakim no D Zedekiah so it's going to be when Zedekiah tries to escape from the king of Babylon so he's going to illustrate that and um, and that's going to take a day so basically uh, this prophecy, this vision ends on the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of the captivity. Okay. So it's going to have this 666 symbol attached to it. Right. And, and so the significance of that, though, is that um, from Jehoiachin's captivity, the 666th year, is going to be the destruction of the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month um, that occurs. So, so there's a whole bunch of things why this 666 is important. But here it's 665, and, you know, it always bothered me. It was one day short of being 666, but it is 666, but it, it, it has to go through this progression first. So Correct. this whole vision has, has lots of things in it. So it is, it is marking the Sunday law. So as Ezekiel progresses here, as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me, the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld and to a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire. And from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. Symbolically, why are we seeing fire and amber? I mean, I think we can accept this very, very simply, that this is a, an appearance of Christ. Mm -hmm. But we have fire and we have amber. Fire will be the destruction of the world. 
after the final judgment. But why is the color of amber important for, as a symbol? How does this interrelate with, with what we're talking about from Judges 10? I don't know. Okay. Let's continue to consider this as we go forward. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? Yeah. So one of the things we note here, uh, because I studied this ever since I was a kid, always found this fascinating. But uh, here, he's not actually literally transported to Jerusalem. I mean, he's 500 miles away, but he's brought in vision to Jerusalem. So this is going to be a vision, not something that lit that he sees literally. Right. And he's going to have this also in chapter 11, verse 1, where he's going to be lifted up and brought to the east gate of the Lord's house. So this is still part of that same vision um, that he's, he's going to have this uh, experience. Um, so he's going to see lots of different things in this vision. Um, and he's going to have a vision again in chapter 10 in this vision, dealing with the living creatures as well. And then, um, and then in, um, at the end of chapter 11, he's going to be, um, this sort of when this vision, uh, this aspect of that vision ends, right? So he's going to have the end of that vision. Um, and then in chapter 12, as still part of that, that vision, that is, it's not a new date, but that's when he's going to dig this hole in the wall um, and, and take all of his stuff out of, of the wall. So it's still all part of things that are going to be happening in connection with this date, but then once he does that in the nighttime, all of the rest of that is going to be on the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of the captivity. So he's going to be giving these prophecies, but those prophecies aren't necessarily in vision. Um, and, and this is an important point because at the beginning, also he has this vision where he's going to be carried away um, and brought to uh, the children of the captivity. And he's going to sit there for um, a week. Where is this here? I um, can't remember where that is exactly, which verse. Uh, I think that's chapter 2. Um, anyway, so, so there he's in vision. So you have to distinguish when when time passes in vision and time passes in reality. And uh, so sometimes he has time pass in a vision. But in chapter 12, that's not going to be in vision when he digs that hole in the wall of his house and carries out his stuff as an illustration. Um, same thing sort of, sort of happens. So we, we need to understand how the visions of Ezekiel work. And, and this is a good illustration of how they work, is this uh, the second vision. I don't know if that's helpful, but okay, no, it is. but as we're as we're going into this, mm -hmm. he, which we have accepted as being Christ, put forth the form of a hand. Mm -hmm. The form of a hand, not a hand. 
and took me by C.C. Rocher, a lock of mine head, is yeah. the way this is translated. Yeah. But yet, this lock that's being translated here, tzitzi, mm -hmm. only occurs in two other verses in the Bible. Yeah, which refers to the fringes on the garment. But aren't those fringes yeah. on the garment also to be uh, separated with a blue band? And aren't they to be there as a memorial mm -hmm. to remind to remind the people of what's supposed to be their covenant with God. Yeah, because uh, it's the color of the sky, which uh, reminds them of God's covenant, but also the cover, the, the, the law was written, uh, carved on blue stones. So, so it r reminds them of the law. Okay. So this reminder, this lock of mine head, mm -hmm is supposed to be a memorial of serving God both in spirit and in truth. Uh -huh. So Ezekiel the priest is being reminded of the importance of the law. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. Why between the earth and the heaven? Because Christ was when when he when he was crucified, he was between earth and heaven. And we're supposed to be earthly creatures are supposed to be lifting our minds up toward heaven constantly. All right. Now the Spirit brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. And this is going to be the looking glass vision. Yes. Because in Ezekiel 8.3, when we're dealing with this, <clears throat> as we consider the Marah, this becomes a deeply personal vision one that is not the panoramic vision like the calzone not like the mare the snapshot vision but the one where we are brought to examine ourselves to see if we have a likeness to christ yeah, so this is a revelation of Christ. So this is similar to John's vision in Revelation chapter 1. Okay, agreed. And, and Daniel also has this type of vision. Right. So this looking get glass vision, we know and that the law, the law is a mirror. Yes, I was going to. Yeah, and we see that. Sorry. In, it yeah, we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and um, in uh, James chapter one i believe yes and i just like to add that all three of them were in exile when they got got these these visions too and and amber is like gold and aren't our characters supposed to be like gold in a sense when we're purified yeah so Don, john daniel and ezekiel are all in exile when they have these mara visions okay now as a point, and this is this is something that I wrestled with, but came to a an understanding where I have been very much at peace over the last several years. Is there a numerical value that we have placed upon the calzone vision? Well, the the twenty five twenty. All right. Now, in the mare. Is there a numerical value that has been placed upon it? Well, I think it's the seven times. In the Marais? I think so. Well, 
Daniel would disagree with you. Oh, so where does Daniel place it? The 2300? Yep. Okay. Um, so if you look up this Mare and... Because he calls it the vision of the evening and the morning. Yeah, but that's okay. Okay, okay. So not the Mara. You're talking about the Mara. Okay, that's yeah. Correct. Okay, I'm talking about the the Mara. Right. So the Mara, I believe, um, can refer to um, what Daniel sees in Daniel chapter ten. Right, because that's where he has the Mara vision, not the Mara. So the Mara is 2300. I agree, um, but the Mara. Even though it happens in chapter 10 after Daniel chapter 9. Right. Right. Um, this is going to be in response to um, this decree of Cyrus, right? That is the first step, the first of the decrees that's going to lead to the start of the 2300 days. Right. And and so in Daniel chapter 10, we know that's going to be the vision of, of chapter 11 and 12, or the prophecy of chapter 11 and 12. It happens with this vision in chapter 10. And, and that's going to be the Mara, right? So that's going to be what would be paralleling Ezekiel uh, chapter 8, verse 3. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you this. And, and also right? Ezekiel 1, 1 is also a Mara. But anyway, yeah. Right, agreed. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this. <clears throat> is it possible that there's a numerical value for the Marah and that that numerical value is 220? So why wouldn't you put it as the 70 weeks? Because it's going to be starting this period. What is the purpose of the 70 weeks? Well, it's to reveal Christ. Is it also not to bring a reunion between Christ and his people? Yeah. But it's, it's really about the cross at its center. And also the, um, uh, you know, connecting that to the destruction of the temple, the earthly temple. Right. So Christ's body is a temple in a sense, too, but it's going to connect to the destruction of, of Jerusalem, specifically the temple in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. It's going to address that, especially the last two verses, dealing with the midst of the week. So um, I don't know how you would attach it to the 220 or the 220, yeah, the 220. This with the the Marah, mm -hmm. this vision that's being shown here in Ezekiel 8, verse 3, just as we were addressing this with Daniel 10, but mm -hmm. we also can go back in the history with Moses and the children of Israel, because there's a Marah there as well. Mm -hmm. I believe it's showing our great need for ourselves to be examined so that we may be unified and brought back into a true relation with Christ and with the law. Yes, that's correct. So then if we're going to connect it just to a time period, remember what I just said about um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 8 in that this is addressing a period of 666 years right. symbolizing that. that's going to end with the destruction of the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month which we see in his third vision in chapter 20 right so we know that we have these these first three visions that are all going to be connected with the destruction of Jerusalem um, in some ways, and more explicitly from the one that starts with the third vision. But um, it's going to be those 666 years of the captivity that's going to be a fulfillment of what we see in Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, 26 and 27. 
right? The midst of the week is going to be tied to the destruction of the temple, the city and the temple. And so if we were going to attach the Marah to anything, we would have to attach it to the 70 weeks, which is Daniel chapter 9, right? Agreed. Because that's what's being talked about. So that's all I'm saying is I'm not sure how you would attach it to the 220. The I can't see a way to do that. The number of the 220 is a symbol. It's a symbol of restoration. Correct. Right. And the 70 weeks is also a symbol of restoration if the people would accept it. Mm -hmm. But we both, we, we're all aware that they didn't accept this. So that people, the Jews, were no longer God's denominated people and others took their place. Yeah. And the number of years, if you add 220 to 490, right, you get 710. Okay. Seventh month, 10th day. Right. Right. So you have this symbol of restoration. So, I mean, in, in a sense, you can say the 20, 220 is a, a tied to that because it is tied to the 2300 to make the 2520. Correct. And, and it is tied to uh, because what you're dealing with is literal Israel, that 220 years in which they're being punished um, for uh, their transgression of the sabbatical rest of the land. And it happens in a period of four judgments that happen over a period of 220 years progressively. Ends in their captivity, uh, but also ends with that uh, restoration of the city, the sanctuary, and um, the people, right? So they're all back there. But they have a period of 490 years of probation that is then given to them, to literal Israel. But literal Israel is going to have their probation close at the end of that time. And when their probation closes, they have rejected that covenant. And it now, the blessings and the curses pass to spiritual Israel. Agreed. Right. So, so if we're going to attach the 220 to it, I, I, you, you can, but only with the 490. Because the 490 shows the transition from literal to spiritual. The 220 is a restoration that happens just with literal Israel. That is, literal Israel goes into captivity progressively. They come out of captivity progressively. And in 457 BC, city, the sanctuary, and the people are all have all been restored. It's but, interesting that yeah, you bring uh, it's interesting yeah. that you bring up the 490, because as I was going through some things yesterday on my phone, I noted that there were some pictures I had taken from a presentation at, at the School of the Prophets mm -hmm. where Jeff had lined out six or seven different symbols of the 490. Now, from the chat, it's been presented that John 2, 19 to 21 would link the numbers 3, 220, and 46. Why and how do we see this? Why would this be important? Okay, I'll just read it. Yeah, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the Jews questioning him, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. So, of course, when he rose again, his body was restored. So there you have the 220 and the 3 and the 46. It's pretty obvious. Okay. All right. Now, Ezekiel is brought to the door of the inner gate which looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? How do we address this? 
I mean, we we'll obviously have different applications of, of how we've looked at this. So in Adventist history, where did we make the application? <coughs> we lined it up with the first generation, right? Correct. And so this image of jealousy was what specifically? The rejection of the 2520. Okay, well, yeah, so it's rejection of the foundation of the message. But what was the rejection of the 2520? I mean, that's what it was, but what is it? Why is it, why is it illustrated by this image of jealousy? Well, is it, isn't it also the rejection of Miller's rules? Right. So it's a rejection of Miller's rules and the adoption of uh, the Protestant method, method of Bible study. Right. Right. So uh, Uriah Smith's going to use a logic based upon Hebrew grammar, <laughs> but ignoring Miller's rules. And, and but even we if also at his explanation... Even if you look at his explanation, he um, is is actually not really looking at what those verses are saying. That is, the verses he uses from Jesenius don't support his argument at all. They don't support the idea that uh, the seven times is uh, in intensity and not a duration. Okay, Angela, you had a comment? Yeah, couldn't we also say that the rejection of the 2520 is this claim that's been going on for years now, that we can sin till Jesus comes. In other words, we're ignoring that we're accountable, and therefore we are, as we, they think, the people that are pro proposing this, they're saying that uh, we're not subject to the blessings, and or we're certainly not subject to the curses. If well, we can sin until Jesus comes, and then we're going to somehow be transmuted into holy beings? Well, it definitely wasn't that way when it was rejected. I mean, the rejection of the 2520, none of those people would have taken the position we're going to sin until Jesus comes. Because that that's going to be a progression of these um, abominations that's going to lead to that. Um, but it does lead to that, because once you reject... Yeah the rules of, of how to study the scriptures, then you're going to come to those logical conclusions on, on everything else in the Bible. But they didn't know. That's the thing about a step in apostasy, is you don't know where it leads. And I like the fact that it's this, this word jealousy, because um, that's really where Satan his pride, I mean, we know it's pride, but pride is manifest in jealousy. And that's the problem that occurred in this movement in 2012. Because Parminder believed that his ideas um, needed to be heard. And he had to do it in a clandestine way, because he knew that it wouldn't be accepted if he was just to present what he believed because he had ideas that were quite contrary uh, to how Jeff looked at things. Um, but he may have thought that this was some sort of spiritual insight that he had, but really it's, it's pride. And we see this happen all the time with human beings. People will, you know, have some criticism and, and I've seen this criticism of Jeff, uh, which, you know, they don't bring to Jeff himself. They bring to some person that they might think is sympathetic. And and the criticism is because Jeff doesn't agree with something that they wrote him a letter or an email. Maybe they even ignored, Jeff ignored the email, or they tried to talk to Jeff about it and, and they thought he was dismissive. And that that whole thing just kind of simmers in them until they think now that, that Jeff is in error uh, and, you know, he somehow uh, fulfilled his role as Miller now. And so we're the ones with the truth or this person is the one with the truth. And, and they may even think that they're Samuel Snow or something like that, um, though they may not say it 
out loud, but you can tell by talking to them they think that. And, and this is just jealousy. Um, so that's kind of where it starts. Um, and, and we can see um, that what happened, what manifested itself in 1888, which is going to mark the end of that um, first generation, it's really going to be jealousy about those young upstarts who are presenting something that uh, the older generation feels is um, a rejection of, of righteousness by faith in the way that they understood it, a rejection of some of the arguments that they have used uh, to defeat Protestants in, in debates. Right, because if you take the position that the law in Galatians is the moral law, well, that that's one of the arguments that they used to defend the the Sabbath was that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. So, so this is the first step always in in apostasy is this jealousy, and so we see this in 2012, and and the question is, this is a Mara vision, a Mara vision. So um, are we going to see this in ourselves? Because this is for self-examination. Even though we're applying it to Parminder, it's not meant to uh, take away from the fact that we have to examine ourselves. In a sense, we're looking at the movement. I think it's a lot more than just a sense that we're looking at the movement. <laughs> I tend to understate things. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> but in this in this situation, mm -hmm. as we have been applying in Judges, we have a message in Judges, and that message is bringing us to consider the faults within us so that we may more properly examine this before we are presented with the Mara vision. So, so I think it's the Mara vision that we need. I mean, yes. I understand what you're saying, but we need a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, we need to be undone. We need to see that we're men of unclean lips. Um, <clears throat> all of those things. We need to lie on the ground as dead men, with no spirit left in us, and we need to be touched by Christ. We need to be lifted up. And we need to realize that we are in exile. That's no. Angela's point, that, that we're in captivity, that this world is not our home. I felt that since... You broke up there, Angela. She turned off. I mic. just said I felt like a misfit since childhood. I've often said that I feel like I'm I'm an exile, and now I really know why. Okay. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So here we're addressing Ezekiel's first vision that we would see in chapters one through seven. Now the translators make note of this, where we have it in Ezekiel one, we also see it in Ezekiel three. So there's, there's a lot for us in the visions of Ezekiel to have to consider when we are addressing what our need is and how we're going to go to be able to present this message. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I tend to dwell on this quite a bit just because I'm fascinated by it. But, you know, we have in 1 verse 1, it's going to be uh, this Mara vision. I saw visions of God, right? Okay. This, in glass vision. So when you behold Christ, it is a looking glass, and the law is a looking glass. It's a mirror. 
<coughs> Agreed. Okay. Um, and then I'm fascinated by this um, um, this being lifted up in spirit, right? So in Ezekiel 3.12, Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. Right, and he's going to hear the noise of the wings of living creatures, right, this great rushing. And, and then he's going to be carried. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, by the hand of the Lord, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv. Uh, that's not the Tel Aviv in Israel. This is the Tel Aviv in Babylon. That dwelt by the river of Kibar. And I sat there and sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. And, and this seven days, we had looked at this before, but you know, one of the things we see in Ezekiel 1 1 is he has this vision at midnight on July 21st, the fifth day of the fourth month, right. in 592 BC. But this seven days does not pass in reality, it's just a symbol because he's in spirit. And so in chapter 8, He's going to be lifted up. He's in spirit. He comes out of that part of the vision at the end of chapter 11. And then, and then he's going to act out this part of the vision dealing with uh, Zedekiah's captivity. And um, so, you know, these are important points, but, you know, just from understanding the chronology, but also this being lifted up by the spirit uh, in in um, in these two visions I mean what does that really mean what is this being lifted up in vision because it's very different from the other parts of his vision if you know what I mean right because he's in this uh, he's like he's in heaven right I mean he's in He's not just seeing, you know, some, he's not being just given some prophecy. He's seeing something that is a revelation of Jesus Christ in those parts of the vision. Well, when he's being lifted up, is he not being separated from the earth? Yeah. So he's being separated from that that is directly related to man. And we are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right. You know, and we, we talk about, it's, you know, being lifted up as, a, as an enzyme, all these different types of things. But I don't know if we really appreciate what this Mara vision is, how it's going to affect us. Um, if, if we have a comparison, in some ways we talk about this morale vision as something that, that we need to go through as an experience. But I think its ultimate um, manifestation is what happens during the time of Jacob's trouble, which is after the close of probation. When the last bit of earthiness is going to be removed. So then we could say this also relates to Acts 2, 2 through 4, where the Holy Spirit descended also with the sound of a rushing and filled all that were in that house, well, in the upper room, so that they could be empowered to go out and give the message. Mm -hmm. Their earthliness had been removed in the sense that they had confessed their sins and made things right with God and with their brethren. Yeah, but I, I still think the earth, earth, earthiness being removed uh, with the 144,000 is something that has never happened with any generation. I mean, it obviously would have happened with uh, uh, Enoch, and it would have happened with Elijah. Um, but it's what prepares God's people to be translated. That is, there is no attachment to the earth whatsoever. Amen. And, and so we can experience this as we see Christ, um, at least in part. Right. But, but there comes a time when this, its complete manifestation of this revelation of Christ is seen 
when the cry goes from the lips of the 144,000, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, so, so the same cry that went from the lips of Christ on the cross goes from their lips. And, and so they experience something that none of us have really experienced. That is, they experience of the second death, if you want to put it that way. They experience what Christ experienced, that complete separation from God. And yet they still cling to Christ, just as Christ cl clung to his Father. Amen. Now, as we're as we go forward, then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. <clears throat> so the image of jealousy is the first abomination. Now, he also is always told to look. Yes. Right. So he's told to behold something, lift up his eyes. He's told to observe. Yeah. Did we not observe what was going on with Parminder? Well, we definitely needed to see what was happening, to see it for what it was. Right. But I, I think at the time, um, I mean, the thing, the, my impression about 2012, I mean, because it, it made such a strong impression upon me, uh, I think for many people in the movement, it was it was hardly even noticed. That is, it wasn't dwelt upon, particularly by Jeff after the time. You know, nobody was really talking about Parminder and his time setting. Even when he started to come back into the movement, it, it was like people just didn't know about it or never thought about it. But it was always something that was on my mind. When he came back, I was wondering, why is Parminder back presenting and, and i liked parminder right um you know because he was charming and i was a bit fooled by that but i always had you know in my thoughts about this time setting aspect you know how did that come about and i didn't really know much about it i never asked him about it um but it was almost like it was forgotten so we had this warning and, and yet, you know, Harminder still ended up in the movement. It wasn't heated. Jeff didn't even heed his own warning. He, he should not have put Parminder back into any kind of uh, position. But Parminder continued to be active in Wales. And, and so and Jeff had known him for a long time, or known of him anyway. Um, so, you know, why this happened within the movement is because we didn't really heed this. We didn't see the condition the movement was in. And, and so, I mean, jealousy was existing in the movement, not just in Parminder. Lots of different people had this jealousy, and I saw that manifested many times in many ways. So... So <clears throat> now we're being given this admonition to turn again and you will see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. 
So first, we are beholding the northward gate and there's this altar with the image of jealousy in the entry. Now we're being, we come to the door of the court. What court? Is this the inner court of the temple? Yeah, this is the inner court of the temple. Okay. Then said he. I noticed that. It's, sorry, do I? I'm noting that it says turn again. It says, and for turning again, I think, repent, keep repenting, and I'll show you more. So if we want to receive more from God, we have to keep repenting. Okay. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. What symbols do we see from the creeping things? And what symbols do we see from the abominable beasts being inside the temple? And why are we being told of the idols of the house of Israel? Yeah. Well, so first thing, so this this door, there's this. Um, so the door isn't just like you got a wall with a door in it. You actually have an entryway. <coughs> and in that entryway, there's this room on the side of it. And that's where this is occurring. But you're digging in the wall first to find the door. Yeah, so he's going to dig and he's going to look into this room, right? Instead of going, um, yeah, so, so this is something that's hidden, right? That he has to dig for. All right. Right? Um, and... So he's brought to the door of the court. So this is this entryway of the courtyard. And it's going to have this room beside it. And then he looked and there was a hole in the wall. So he could look through this. He could dig through this hole in the wall. And then he could, uh, then he finds this door, right? So however that is. So there's something that's hidden. For him to actually have to dig into and then he's going to look through this door and he's going to see what the ancient men are doing in the chambers of their imagery that is there in their imaginations the thoughts of their hearts so this isn't something that literally is occurring right there is no images painted on the inside of some room in israel in, in Jerusalem, right? But what he's seeing is the secret chambers of the heart. So this is Christ in the investigative judgment. We could say it's not only the elders. I mean, we could say, okay, they're the priests, they're the general conference staff or whatever, but it's also us. What is in our hearts? What's in our minds that needs to be cleansed? Needs to be exposed and then plans yeah but 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 the, i mean we can look at this in the context of the church we know that this is going to be uh what's manifest in 1888 to 1919 right so when we applied this to the church that's the period of time the second generation that this is uh illustrating but in this movement if we're going to look at this, what would this be illustrating? Well, <clears throat> is this not 
an illustration of the issues that arose within the movement in setting aside Miller's rules and beginning to accept the teachings from outside, such as occurred with the path of the just and the others when they, when they sought to use commentaries, Protestant commentaries in their understanding of the book of Joel. Yeah. So that's where I would place this. So, so it's, it's addressing something in the movement. We're starting with Parminder's, uh, you know, year, but, and, and this is going to be manifest in 2014. Now, now Stephen had noted that, you know, the letter that, um, that Jamal wrote, um, you know, is quite um, even handed in some ways. Uh, that was, uh, I'm not sure when it was written. I think it was in March of 2014. I never heard about it till the summer. But um, that was sort of to hide a, a type of animosity that, that, that I saw personally with Jamal. So, um, and, and with others. And it definitely manifested itself afterwards that even if they had been judged unfairly by Jeff, um, if they had manifested a Christ-like spirit of, of patience and allowed God to just take care of the situation, uh, then, you know, Jeff would have been demonstrated to be wrong. But, um, and, and you can't necessarily say that Jeff was uh, without fault in that area because he listened to rumors and he helped sort of um, feed the rebellion in some ways by how he dealt with it. But, you know, that's just us on the outside looking at something, not knowing really what's going on. Right. But, but the thing is, there was this... Um, this type of idolatry, and we saw it manifested in these groups that left. And and there wasn't just the path of the just. There was a Milianos group. There was that other guy with the bow tie, the black guy with the bow tie, um, who just shortly came into the movement for a while with his ministry. Uh, there was quite a few other uh, people in groups that weren't really organized. Obviously, uh, uh, um, Don Frost. Oh, definitely, Don. Yeah. So so we can see that this was all this. Uh, I mean, to me, that's what is God is showing us that there's something going on in these hearts. But we also know that this isn't just talking about those groups that left. This is talking about the movement at large. You know, especially the leadership. But But if you're following a leadership... And I'm not trying to put Jeff here in this class, but because um, I don't think he is. I don't think he's part of this abomination. But definitely the people around him uh, were part of this abomination. Jeff was just not aware of it because we saw it manifested later on. Okay. And, you know, and even one thing I always think about with, uh, because this is sort of that, uh, that period from 1888 to 1919. Um, Ellen White traveled around with uh, Jones, Wagner, and Prescott, right? or at least Jones and Prescott. And Ellen White has a lot of good things to say about Prescott. She didn't seem to see, or God never showed her, uh, where Prescott was going. I don't know of any negative counsel towards Prescott early on. But Prescott becomes the ringleader in 1919. You know, at the start of the third generation. But there, <clears throat> there is quite a bit of warning about Prescott prior to her demise. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, but I'm just saying that early on there isn't. Okay. I mean, definitely by the time you know they're editing the Great Controversy uh, in the 19, uh, um, 
1910, 1911. Yeah, there. So, um, you know, Prescott's trying to get Ellen White to edit her book and correct the errors in it. And, and she takes almost none of his corrections. So by then, I'm pretty sure she understands it. But, um, but yeah, this is, this is something that's manifested in the second generation where God's messenger is surrounded by people who are actuated by different principles. And it's this secret chambers, this what's going on in their heart, something that can't be seen on the outside. And it can only be understood uh, through this mare vision. But also, it's in our own hearts. Because, you know, we can look at these others on the outside, but, but we're going to continue through these generations, and God's different is going to be manifest in us as well as we progress through this history. I am intrigued as we're looking at this. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold a door. So the reason I'm, I'm intrigued by this is the majority of the time that this word for dig, Cathar, is being used, we're going to find it in this second vision of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Because we find it in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 12, verses 5, 7, and 12. But when we compare other verses with it, we have Job 24, 16. In the dark they dig through houses in which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They know not the light. Mm -hmm. Amos 9, verse 2. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Now that's just a couple of examples of the alternate verses, the other verses where we're dealing with this digging through the wall. Because what are they doing when they dig through the wall? They're forcing an entrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it, it in the word means um, to dig into houses, you know, for burgl burglary, burglary, right? Right. Uh, so a burglar uh, digs into a house. It's a not burglar, just a regular type of digging. Right. A burglar forces entry to a house. Mm -hmm. So basically we're, what we're seeing here is that Ezekiel is being told to force entry into this part of the temple. Go mm -hmm. in where they don't want you to see. Mm -hmm. Examine these areas. Examine this worship that is not being done openly. This is the kind of thing that we, we were seeing with Parminder. This is what we were seeing with Path of the Just, that we were seeing with Emiliano. All of these things are being done more in secret. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want it known by many of the others. What they wanted was their money. Yeah. Now, I find it interesting when I talk to Jeff about this, you know, he didn't seem to think it was about money um, for some reason. Um, and I think it's partly because, um, you know, Jeff was never actuated by money. Um, he seemed to think it was more, you know, people just wanted followers for 
their own egos or something like that. Um, but I saw it was about money. Just because they directly actually talked about the money. They didn't like the money going to Jeff and not to them. Right. And, and that was made really clear by Jamal in, back in 2012. You know, send your money to these other ministries, not to Jeff, is what he told us. Because these other ministries need the money. And, of course, that would include his ministry. But, you know, he was including these other ministries besides his own so that it looks more uh, generous, I guess. But it, it seemed obvious to me that he wanted uh, money as well. Right. Jeff was taking because what happened is their ministries had joined Jeff's movement and now the money was being funneled away from their ministries to Jeff that that's sort of the the way that it, he he's was stating it yep so, yeah. yeah you probably experienced that too as well right very, very much. Yeah. I mean, I have seen this more and more, where, especially with the the local conferences, that they're more concerned about the cash flow mm -hmm. than they are with the conversion. Mm -hmm. No, and I know with um, what happened in the 90s there with Hope International and uh, uh, the other groups there, whatever they were called, um, Heartland uh, and um, the other one. I can't think of the other ministry. But anyway, the, con the what the conference was concerned about is that tithe money was going um, to these groups but that tithe money would never have gone to the conference anyway. Well, because the people who were supporting these ministries never supported the conference. What was the consideration in 1888? When Ellen White, Jones, and Wagner came out, came away from the presentation in Minneapolis, they began giving these presentations throughout the then known country. And the leadership of the church became incensed because as they would give their presentations on righteousness by faith, it is noted that great monies, great funds came in unbidden. They didn't have to ask for, for donations. They didn't have to ask for money. They came in because the message touched the people's hearts. Yeah. And the leadership of the church began to be afraid that they were going to lose the control of the money. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this idol this worship goes way back. It's not just in the 1990s. It was in the 1880s as well. Mm -hmm. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all of the idols of the house of Israel. We're not worshiping God we are now worshiping the form of creeping things and the abominable beasts and all of the idols that have come in, not only into the church, but also in, into the movement. Yeah. Now, often we try to look at this, well, this, you know, because here it's illustrating idols, right? Images, right. thoughts. But uh, it's not necessarily how it's manifested in our day in the way that, you know, this literal sense. Um, but sometimes people try to look for that. They try to look for, 
you know, satanic symbols or something, that that means people are worshiping idols. But you don't need these satanic symbols or anything like that for it to be an idol. And, and this is talking about what's inside the imaginations of their hearts, right? This is representing um, what's going on inside this type of idolatry. Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, these leaders were necessarily literally worshiping pagan idols, but definitely they had the root of what that idolatry was. Right. Well, the one thing that we can look at with that, remember later in Ezekiel, he talks about how um, he uses the illustration of the, the, the pot, right? And, and they look at those that were not in Jerusalem, not part of Judah, as being cast out and that they were safe in Jerusalem. And, and this was this comparing themselves with others and not really seeing their danger. Right. So, I mean, this is the type of self-righteousness that exists in humanity. This is a dependence upon self and a lack of a dependence upon God. And, and that's why with money, why, why, you know, why people think they need money, why the church thinks it needs money, and why it's, you know, it's always about, well, the money, because, you know, we need it for the Lord's work. But the Lord doesn't need money. He needs our hearts. The reason why he asked for money is not because he needs money, but because he needs us depending upon him and trusting in him. And it's, it's a symbol of us not trusting in the things of this world and knowing that everything that we have comes from God, both in the tithes and the offerings. It's not really about where the money needs to go as much as it is about what, what is our heart's uh, affection and where are we connected to this world are we connected to god's kingdom amen um, i actually uh heard my now deceased landlord bragging about the thousands tens of thousands of dollars he'd given to the mainstream church and he was angry when i said you can't buy your way to heaven you're giving to the blind meeting the blind Now, and there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, and every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Where was it? that they would stand with a censer in their hand. Well, that would be in the holy place. And, and also on the Day of Atonement in the most holy place. But... So this is truly a type of false worship that's occurring. Mm -hmm. Because they have every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Now, when I'm, I'm thinking of this and I'm looking at this, when, when I was in grade school, I used to love to study Egyptology. And the walls in the tombs and the temples in Egypt had many depictions of that which the Egyptians saw as being holy. Here we're being told that when he's forcing his way into this temple, he's beholding every form of the creeping things and the abominable beasts and all of the idols are portrayed upon the wall round about. But we have these 70 men that are standing in front of this with their censers in their hands. 
Now, this worship with these censers and this incense, is this lifting up a sweet savor unto God? Is this mingling the prayers of the righteous with what they're doing? Is this portraying Christ? Yeah, it's kind of interesting here. Um, Albert Barnes, in his commentary, it's um, he on commenting on the seventy men. Of course, he he directs us to Exodus twenty four verse nine to ten. Uh, then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness, right. So you can see the contrast between these. So um, he says the vision may have pointed to the contrast between the times, right? Um, and then he says the number seven is symbolic of the covenant between Yahweh and his people. And so the 70 men exhibit forcibly the breach of the covenant. It is a figure of the covert idolatry of the whole people. Right, so the 70 elders represent the movement. Okay. <clears throat> now, to touch very briefly, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. This word translated as portrayed can also mean carved out. <clears throat> so we're dealing with something by the work of man's hands. Mm -hmm. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. This statement closes the second abomination. Within this with the movement, especially what, with what we've been examining, with what happened with Path of the Just, with what happened with so many others that came in and were bright stars for a while and then fell, like Emiliano, like others. They were making the comment that the words of the prophet, Miller's rules, don't mean anything, that this is entirely separate, and we need a more modern application rather than these, quote, old thoughts. Hast thou not, hath, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the chambers of his imagery. We need to have control over our thoughts. We need to be reliant upon Christ for that strength. Because Christ sinned not in deed or in thought. And if we are going to be like him in all ways, we need to practice this concept in all that we are doing. Yeah. Well, um, the thing is, this is all about a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is not something that we can accomplish in our own strength. No, we can't. Now, and I think of Ellen White uh, in Five Testimonies, where she writes about the message to the Laodicean church. And I believe it's there that she refers to Christ knocking on the door of our heart and that we must clean away the rubbish 
that blocks his entrance and open the door and let him in to clean up. Because there is a part that we have to play, um, definitely, that is, but we can't make ourselves pure. We can't change our own hearts. And, um, you know, when the 144,000 go through their experience on the in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have no trust in self. They have learned that lesson. And even though they can see in themselves no good thing, even though they can't bring their actual sins to remembrance because they've gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out, they still see, uh, they have a sense of their own unworthiness and they fear lest that they have done something, that they have some unfor uh, unconfessed sins, not for their own sake, but for Christ's sake, that they, that they represent him correctly. That is their fear. And it's, it's, they have no sense that somehow they have anything to offer to God. And yet we are not in that condition. We actually think that we were pretty good. Right. Now, and, and, and just to add to that, so, so sometimes uh, there's this danger because some people can imagine that they are good because they can control certain aspects of their behavior, the things that they uh, label as important. Um, but, of course, they ignore the weightier matters of the law. So they can criticize their brethren. They can gossip. They can, they can be jealous. Um, but because they eat right and dress right and uh, believe in their mind the correct things, uh, they are righteous, and they're no different than the Pharisees. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, is that referring to us? Are we like that? Okay. So sorry about interrupting you. No, you're fine. We are now to the close of our time together today. Mm -hmm. This last statement is one that I think we're going to need to ponder upon. And as we return to this and the symbols that we have been examining both from Judges 10 and the symbols that we're seeing here. We're going to need more consideration and additional input so that we might more openly address the importance of these symbols and how they're being related with the movement at this time. Now, do we have any other thoughts or comments from what we've covered today? Question. Yes. How can those denominations be applied on our line? Explain, please. I'm asking. How can this generation, for example, the first generation from 1863 up to 1888, how can that be also applied on our line like 1989? Where does it end, the first generation? Well, well, we take the first generation you're, you're talking about from 1844 to 1888. Um, in that first generation, we see this this image of jealousy. And so the way that we apply it to our movement is uh, the jealousy of these different groups um, in 2012, but particularly marked by Parminder. But it's also manifest in other people as well. So that's the way I understand the, the image of jealousy. Okay, anyone else?
I mean, we can also apply it to to the church, which we've which was where we always made the application in 1989. Um, we uh, maybe that's what he's asking how we apply that to um, um, to what happened, not so much in the movement, but in the church in the repeat of history under the first and second angels' messages. Sure, but but I, I you know, mostly we applied it to the four generations, the four abominations. And definitely we can see that it, it, it can apply on, a, on an individual level. It can apply in lots of different levels. But right now we're looking at how it applies to the movement for that period of 18 years. Because that's kind of what we're going to see as we go through these four abominations. That is going to lead to what ended up happening in 2020. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we need your light, the light that is behind us, to help us. For our feet to remain on the path that is before us. Direct us this day. Guide us so that that which is said, that which is done, may be to the glory of your character and not to our character. Help us now. Be with us in all things. So that others may see you reflected by us and that we may come to this vision, this mara, this looking glass and carefully consider that which we need to do to become more like you. Thank you for this opportunity. Direct us as you see best in this day. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.